it's really hard for law enforcement to keep up with hackers for literally one reason. We are really hard to catch. For example, I was for the most part the only hacker, almost the only hacker I had met during 11 years in prison. I may have only met one or two others. It's weird. It's like in the back of my mind, I'm having like, like flashbacks, I guess. Because I was literally raided right there as the FBI were rushing in to apprehend me from Tower One. Safety's off. Like, freeze. Like, show us the gun, show us the gun. Where's your gun? I have no idea. I have, don't even have a moment to process what is happening. There, there was a, a thought in my mind that if I fled out the other door, which was completely unguarded, I would have been shot. I could have been shot. And, the, and just having a gun pulled on you, like you could feel it. Like you could feel like, like the threat in your body, of the idea of being shot. Now a North Texas security guard is accused of hacking into a hospital's computers and posting video of it on YouTube for a short time. I was the first person in recent U.S. history who was ever convicted for corrupting industrial control systems. There was never a case like mine before. It was the first. And so it created a, it set a precedence of what, you know, what would happen next to whoever did something like this. So my sentence was for two counts of transmitting a malicious code, it was nine years. I ended up doing a, a little bit more than that. <laughs> so I ended up being sent to Siegelville FCI. That's here in Texas. Um, but, you know, for people like me in a system like that, they don't want any room for errors. So they restricted me from being able to email using, you know, their in-house inmate email system. So I was completely cut off from being able to communicate, maintain meaningful relationships, just isolated. And writing letters was the only thing I could really do. So I ended up working out a deal with another inmate to let me use his email so I could fight my case on appeal, right? That was a great idea considering how I was given one year below the statutory maximum of what they could give me. Um, he ended up getting caught and he told prison authorities that I had hacked his email account and that he had no idea that I was using it. So I was thrown into solitary confinement and what ended up lasting for 13 months. Um, 13 months in an eight by 12 cell. Um, and that was during the year 2012. We had the, the hottest heat index on record for Texas. It reached 125 degrees inside my cell without any AC fan, adequate ventilation, and just dead heat 24-7. Um, we had people commit suicide on their first day. Talk about living through that. We had guards fainting from heat exhaustion outside. Imagine what we had to deal with on the inside. For someone like me who, who was raised in theater and in musical arts and where, you know, computers and, and, and dealing or living in a, in a church world, you know, that was my reality. Taking someone like me who is not from the streets and throwing me into an environment with like child molesters, rapists, gangbangers, killers, like it was terrifying. Let me tell you, like it was terrifying because like everything that we know about prison comes from TV. So I didn't want to experience those things, like the stabbings, like prison rape. So a lot of things had to be demystified and a lot of things I had to, had to learn firsthand. For example, I didn't bathe for an entire week when I first got into jail um, because uh, we didn't have any privacy. There was nothing to make, you know, that showering thing private. 
Um, I didn't even eat with general population f um, for over a week because I didn't know what to, what to expect. I didn't know what type of people I would be locked up with. So incrementally, I came out of this shell I had to stuff myself in, in order to see if I would be safe, and I was. I actually was safe. Um, and I had to learn, like, this is a completely different reality. It's a completely different planet. Prison is, has, is nothing like anything out in the free world. And so once I learned to adapt, um, that's where I became, you know, more safe and more confident and how I was going to spend my time. I know people get agitated if, if <laughs> people got agitated during COVID because they couldn't leave their homes, right? Well, imagine if your home was an eight by 12 cell made of cinder block and concrete and razor wire, and you can't leave that. It's like a closet, like a walk-in closet, about the size of one. Um, but there's, there's no fans. You don't feel AC because it doesn't exist. You're, it's just dead heat, and it changes your perspective. You're subject to so much sensory deprivation, and you have to sleep with a light on 24-7. So it's in a constant environment where there's lighting, there's noise, there's, there's no relief. So yes, having experienced that, and having to live like in my underwear because it's so hot that even sleeping on a bed causes heat rashes and you have to constantly wake up in the middle of the night over and over and over to drink water to hydrate or else you will, you could like, you could possibly die in your sleep. It was horrible. Let me tell you, it was bad. There's nothing like this. Siegelville used to serve as an enemy internment camp for the during Second World War. Some of the architect architecture of that facility is that old and non-modernized. So like you've, you're exposed to black mold, lead paint. Um, and if you, if you are lucky to go out into, a, you, know, you know, to do recreation, it's early, early in the morning when it's still nighttime and it's in an enclosure. So uh, it's, it causes even more uh, sensory deprivation so I experienced a lot of auditory hallucinations to the point where I could no longer distinguish um, what was real and what wasn't. Like, it was bad. Um, and what was worse is that because you're in a controlled environment, you can't find a uh, legal remedy. And they control your mail. They control everything. And because of the different personalities amongst the guards, there are people who will go far and great lengths to make your experience harder while you're in that type of environment. Um, monitoring and, and censoring my mail or withholding mail and, and even harassing my own attorney when I managed to miraculously find an attorney to help me with that situation. To, to intercept mail that's legal mail so I wouldn't receive it or no, be able to communicate with him. It was bad. It was very bad. I mean, it definitely played a significant role in dissociative identity disorder, which I struggled with really bad. Uh, PTSD, I do have that really bad anxiety. Um, whenever it's extremely hot, um, I think about it. I think about it a lot. And, but that experience, is the reason why I, I, I use this phrase, turn your pain into power. It's the reason why I am active in humanitarian uh, movements, uh, justice reform, um, prison reform. That's something that I can use that experience for, for good. Um, and so even though I may not be you know, like experiencing a trigger, I'm always reminded of it because I work with inmates who experience these things. I work on a daily basis communicating or corresponding over the inmate email system with people who are experiencing similar um, situations. So it's something that I can never really escape. It's something that's innately a part of my everyday life now. <laughs> hmm. Before I was arrested, 
you know, I was married and I, I had a 13 month old daughter. I was the rock of my family, of, of all my family, for my mother, for my siblings. And once I was gone, just, it changed everything. And it changed everything for them. Uh, for my wife and for my kid, I never got to raise my child, even to this very day. Um, my wife, she ended up divorcing me early on. Um, and it's something I don't, I can't really fault anyone for doing because, you know, when you're locked up with someone, you know, that you're in love with or you're in a relationship with, like, they're also locked up because they're waiting for your phone calls that only last 15 minutes and you only have 300 minutes a month. Uh, you're waiting for their mail and you're trying to help them and you realize at the end of the day that you can't. So you're constantly, like, your loved ones out there are constantly doing a time of their own alongside you and it's traumatic for them. Um, so you really end up becoming, you know, alone while you're doing time.